Hello and welcome to another edition of The Extra Point. I am Kendall Gammon. Thanks as always to Crown Automotive of Lawrence, Kansas, 785-843-7700 for all your Volkswagen and Toyota needs or simply go to crownautomotive.com. And now I am joined by my good friend, simply known as the Great Dane, Morton Anderson, 25 year veteran in the NFL and a Hall of Fame. There's lots of other awards that he's gotten. He would prefer that I would continue to go down the list and <laughs> list them all, but I will not, but we will talk <laughs> about him. Uh, Morton, how you doing, man? Hey, great to, great to see you, KG. Always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, time spent with you is always a good time and quality. So excited to be with you, brother. Yes, the uh, check's on the way for giving me that, uh, that, totally. that go-to. Um, you know, we spent a couple of years in Kansas City together and then I've stayed in touch uh, since. And, you know, I want to talk about that a little bit today. I want to talk about your career in general and and really probably a, a lot of your mindset. Um, not only, well, we'll, we'll just go back, but let, let's just start with this. Let, let's go back uh, to a high school kid who's over here uh, from Denmark uh, in a uh, student exchange. Uh, and you never go back. You end up uh, kicking the ball. How does that come to be? Yeah, well, it's um, serendipity, I think, maybe is one of the words, you know? Yeah. That you could use there. You could use a lot of words. But <laughs> and we will. Chance, luck, circumstance. Right. Um, being at the right place at the right time with the right people mm -hmm. and the right vibe and, and somebody pushing you saying, you should try this because certainly my... Uh, my focus was really on soccer. Right. And uh, the, the high school team didn't have a soccer team. So that pretty much eliminated that sport. Mm -hmm. And they needed a kicker. They had their quarterback, Tim Wilbur, whose father was the head coach, Bob Wilbur. And he was the quarterback, the free safety and the kicker. So they wanted to take a few of those things off the plate so he could concentrate on being the quarterback. We were a very good team. Right. Ended up going to semi-state, ended up uh, as one of the best teams. You know, Ben Davis High School is a huge school, 3,000 students. So we were playing in the uh, in the biggest classification as it was. And we were playing against really good teams in Indiana. Now, I know Indiana is not known for football necessarily. Uh, you know, it's basketball state. But, right. but relatively speaking, we were really good. We were ranked nationally. We had really good players. And so when when that you know, position opened up after they, and they knew, I mean, they knew about me mm -hmm. because my host father was a, a vice principal at the school. So he had already had a conversation with Bob Wilbur and, you know, about me knowing my background in soccer. So they were hoping against hope that I could actually right. put foot to ball and, and get the ball in the air, which was in the beginning, the challenge really, because the ball wasn't round. <laughs> exactly. You know, there was, there was a problem. You know, I was expecting a round ball, and uh -huh. they present this ball that's egg shaped and uh, or oblong, oblong, yeah, oblong. You know, uh, what Morton was was it really? I mean, was it somewhat really that odd that you're like, okay, wait a minute, what's what's going on here? Yeah, what am I? You know, what am I supposed to do with this? It looks like it's meant to be thrown, not kicked. Right. Um, which it is. You know, yeah. if you really think about it. Yeah, uh, it's, uh -huh. it's meant to be thrown, carried, and and caught. Uh, so it took a little bit. There was a learning curve, but they mm -hmm. did line up eighty guys on the sideline. They wanted to see this foreign kid kick the football, and and you know I I was out there in, in all this equipment, and I, I kept arguing whether this was all necessary um, to wear all the all this stuff. And I have no doubt that you were arguing. I was definitely arguing. I was I was make pleading my case, couldn't I just wear shorts and a t-shirt? And that became oh. painfully obvious that that equipment was was needed later on. Right. So yeah, the ball flew high and long quickly and I had 80 new friends and that was the start to my American dream. It really I, was. I love that, 80 new friends. But yeah. uh, it's something that I've talked about before. You know, people think because I long snapped so, so long in the NFL that I must have done it my whole life. I didn't yeah. do it until my third year in, in college. And I talk about it's so important to take coaching and sometimes other people recognize strengths that you don't even know you have. And that's, to, uh, I think that's what you're telling me right there. Well, you know, it's, it, nobody could really tell me how to do it. I right. mean, I did get a few pointers and said, you know, you try to hit the bottom half of the ball kind of thing. But as I started diving into it, it's really a strike down on the ball. It's not a sweep up. 
Uh -huh. You know, it's almost like a golf swing where you come down on the ball. So that took some time to get used to and the plant foot being not too close to the ball because in soccer, it's a whole different strike on the ball. And, mm -hmm. and you really want to have the ball run around, you know, along the ground, unless you're, you're doing a corner kick. Right. When you're passing the ball, when you're shooting the ball, it's low. Mm -hmm. So to, to flip the brain and say, I got, I got to now get the ball up very quickly because there's 11 guys who want that football. Right. And they're coming at me quickly and from a short distance. So that took some time to get used, of, used to all the noise up front. Yeah. You know, I mean, eight yards away. And back then it was seven yards away. Okay. Yeah. We started at seven and then slowly that matriculated back to now everybody's right. at eight. Everybody's at eight. Yeah, basically. exactly. But that's so, amazing with you and the, and the snap. I didn't realize you didn't snap until the third year in college. Yeah, it just, it, it it's was wild. And, it, you know, somebody saw me messing around and, you know, yeah. lo and behold, as you said, serendipity, right place, right time. And somebody saw something in me that I didn't realize I had. And now that being said, there was some natural talent, just like you're telling me, because you did play soccer. So you, you were used to kicking. So yeah. as you move on more, you have, you, I'd assume have a pretty decent high school career because you end yeah. up going to Michigan State University and, uh, have a nice career there as well to the degree uh, that you're the fourth round or you're a fourth round pick, I believe in the NFL. Is that right? Yeah. Third pick in the fourth round with the saints. Uh-huh. And you and spent, um, was it 13 years with the saints? Mm -hmm. Then you moved on to Atlanta. Yeah. You had a couple, you had a couple years with me here in Kansas city. You were up yeah. in Minnesota, New York uh, Giants for Giants. a year during nine 11. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So a, a lot of different places now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I both speak and get out there and do a little bit. And, and oftentimes I use you for a lot of different reasons uh, uh, on some stuff because you, you had a very uh, profound. That, that's very vague, by the way, Kim. Uh, that what you're saying. <laughs> I need to specifically, <laughs> what do you use me for? And then, Folks, <laughs> if, if you're seeing this right now, this was originally going to be live. And I decided, nope, can't do one live with Morton and I. That's just not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh there, there will be editing involved yes there will be quite a bit of editing okay so <laughs> when i talk to people though and and i talk about you know i had good fortune uh you were nice enough to invite me to the hall of fame ceremony there in canton as i say the closest i'll ever get to a gold jacket but i tell them 25 years in the nfl and if i don't get a re response i tell them again and then i let them know that there needs to be a response because that doesn't happen very often i mean you already know you're in a select group because of the Hall of Fame, uh, but to play 25 years, maybe was there one other person that played that long? Is that correct? Uh, well, George Blanda played 26 years, but less games because back then they were only playing, uh, I think, 14 games a season. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, so, he played 26. so George played 26 years, but less games. But the reason I'm in the Hall of Fame is because of players like you who played at the elite le le level, and I'm not – blowing smoke up your 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 behind just right because you're sitting here but you were the best long snapper I ever had Kendall well, and that and that and you were I mean any anybody who knows the way you did it and how you did it and 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 the type of ball you could deliver right. consistently under under duress it, it made my job a lot easier it made Dan Strasinski's job a lot easier I mean and he was the best holder I had because right. you were the best snapper so it starts there and then it goes to him. And then, you know, I was a pretty good kicker, but if those two components that happens prior to, to me putting foot to ball are not there, then we're not talking about a gold jacket. We're not talking about Ken, Ohio. So you were an integral part of that. Although we only spent two years, they were two of my best years and um, learned a lot from you, man, learned a lot from you. And uh, there, there was a calmness about it. There was a workmanlike professionalism about it that I, that I really embraced that I, I thought we both kind of fed off of I would agree. with Dan. Cause Dan was a little more hyper than we were. He was yes. Uh, but he, uh, but he also bought into it. And, and the three of us, I think mm -hmm. were really uh, powerful. You know, we were, we were very good at what we did individually and collectively. And it was real, it was pretty special. Well, first of all, I, I appreciate the kind words and um, uh, you know, I, I, it was an honor for me to, to be a part of it, but something you bring up, I think is very important. You know, one of my mantras or one of my 
my uh, it's, it's my closing on, on my emails and stuff is laces out and you know, mm. everybody goes back to ace ventura and kind of that jokingly thing but it's really about the fact of snapping the ball for me three and a half revolutions so the laces were out so you either didn't have to see the ball spin or worse yet you didn't kick the laces never. and it's it's really just I mean, never of teamwork never. what's that we never we, we never hit like i mean the, the the ball was presented vertical with laces usually you know, 11 to one o'clock, usually at 12 o'clock, right. because Dan, all Dan had to do was catch it and put it down because you delivered it in a position. The laces were already, like you said, three and a half revolutions. Come on. Yeah. I mean, well, it was machine like and it gave me an extra split second to see the ball. Well, and, and that, there. that was the Huge. intent. I, I think, I mean, I think it's oh. a good lesson for teamwork that, you know, no, no one person does anything alone, do they? I mean, it, 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 there's always a team involved. Even yeah. if you're the only person there, somebody has helped you prepare or somebody yeah. has said something to you uh, in, in the past to help get to you, get you to this point. Would you agree? A absolutely. Listen, you, your butt's in the air. All the, that's, that was what you did. You, you were making your living with your, with, right. with your butt in the air. Okay. And, and, and you did it very well. And you were and, not getting the it, credit. People didn't say when I made a game-winning field goal, oh, that was a great snap by Kendall right. Gannon. I mean. I but you think, did. But I think that's important. Well, but, but you I let got me the know, credit. which is all that well, matters. I, I know. I, and, and again, we, we were like fingers in a glove, you know, they had to yeah. fit together that the whole is bigger than the, the parts. And, but, but each part is so interconnected. And, and, and I think the three of us figured that out pretty quickly, really. And because we had we had a couple of things going for us. We had right. the wisdom of having been in the league for a while. Mm -hmm. So there was no filter. There was no BS. There was no bullshit. I mean, we go, we went right to what right. was uh, important. And we, you know, I'm going to use a Frank Gansism now and yeah. people that don't know Frank Gans senior, he was a big influence in my life, a special teams coach mm -hmm. around the league mm -hmm. and also a head coach with the chiefs for a couple of years. But he said something, you know, I'll never forget. He said powerful, productive relationships based on powerful, productive communication. And that's what we had, the three of us, I felt, mm -hmm. was communication that really cut right through it, right to the essential. And that's that's was so effective for us. Yeah, and as I remember, you used to always carry that with you uh, almost uh, at you all You know, time. I had a laminated sheet. Yeah, exactly. With, with, um, with goals and with sayings and uh, things that made sense to me. Okay, so how about 25 years in the league, at some point in time, those last, I don't know how many years, I mean, father time loses to no one. So at some point in time, the, the body starts to break down some. I know mine did in 15 years, and this is not getting on you. It's it's me asking you, what was your mindset when you were healthy? I mean, as I look back at you uh, in your younger years, I mean, as much as I hate to do this and, and feed your ego, you were rocked pretty good and, and you were put together well, and you had a very, very powerful leg. Um, that's going to slowly wane a little bit as father time. Did the mindset change from when you came into the league to when you were going out of the league, you know, towards the end in those last several years? Uh, just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So the first, I would say I came in in 82. So from 82 to 89, I pretty much winged it with, uh, with really? a, a great amount of arrogance and a great amount of confidence uh, born out of just really uh, youthful oblivion, if you will. Okay. <laughs> out of being uh, ignorant to the fact that you actually have to work out, work out, work out in the off season, and there is an off season. Right. I, I really didn't. I didn't. My off season was was spent traveling. It wasn't spent in the weight room. It wasn't spent uh, in a regimented off season training program. Right. So that was. And now I didn't kick a lot from basically from January to to June. So the first, you know, seven years of my career was pretty much just smoke and mirrors spent on, you know, really just my talent and kind of, and I did go to four Pro Bowls, five, four Pro Bowls, I think, I, during I, that time. Five yeah, Pro Bowls, and, and maybe all, even more. And you're all pro as well. I mean, Pro yeah. Bowls is there's there's somebody on either side, but all pro is considered yeah. the best and you yeah. were a four or five time all pro. Yeah, I was, but. But, and I'm not really sure how that happened because I didn't have a structure. But in 89, I hit what I would consider a performance plateau where I was, I kind of, in my mind, got a little bit worse than I was in, in uh, 88. And so I, I decided to take a, uh, get a hold of Mackie Shillstone. I, I, and I yeah. hired a sports psychologist. I got involved with cognitive intervention, mental training. 
you know, I really kind of took a, a proactive approach to my off season training. I realized, you know, I was 30 years old now, I'm getting ready to turn 30. And I had this year that was kind of, you know, I was going in this direction and all of a sudden, boom, I plateaued. Mm -hmm. That was concerning to me because you either as an athlete, you get better or worse. Nothing right. stays the same. Yep. So I was curious to see how I could, you know, prolong my career. Cause if I had status quoted, I think my career would have been a lot shorter. So from 89 and my rest of my way, you know, I, I had this, I created team Anderson, which was okay. this team of people. I go back to my earlier statement, the sum of the whole, the whole is, right. is just as important as the quality of the parts. And so I had Mackie Shillstone who took care of my fitness and off season training and put that into structure. You know, I had a sports psychologist who put a, 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 a you know, made sense of the mental training and put structure right. to that. I had a massage therapist. I had a, a, a chiropractor. I had a, you know, good financial guy. And I had a good, you know, I had a good team. Yes. That, that were very good. They mm -hmm. were very good at what they did. Mm -hmm. And I let them be very good at what they did. So I could be very good at what I did and continue to manage my, by my behavior to meet the objective, which was to play as long as I could at the highest level. And so I think from 89, I really, I changed the way I looked at it as a profession where in the first seven years, I gotta be honest with you. I was, I was kind of a brat, you know, I really was kind of a brat. I was just immature. And I, I don't think I was proactive in the way I thought about my career, I, I thought about it as a, this is cool, you know, right. <laughs> but I don't think long term, I had a plan. But that came after that performance plateau. And mm -hmm. then it kind of elevated. And I think really, it, it probably gave me another seven to eight years. Wow. On the back yeah. end. Yep. Because when I like yeah. when I got to Kansas City, let's face it, I was in my mid early to mid 40s, right? I was not a sick, I didn't have a six pack. You know, I had a, I had a belly. I had a, I, I, I mean, I was in good kicking shape, but right. if you looked at me and say, that dude doesn't look like an athlete, you know, I, <laughs> just call I'm it not, like it I'm is. I'm not talking. I'm not saying <laughs> you're, you're agreeing. I know your silence is telling <laughs> and that's just a fact, but it doesn't mean I couldn't get it done. Now exactly. I, did, I wasn't able to bang 60 yarders. I wasn't able to kick off effectively really in my late forties, but who the hell is right? Come on. Nobody can. So my goal to play to sit 50, I didn't quite get there. I got till 47. I had my best year statistically at 47. And really in the last third of my career, my, my main concern was, you know, can I play at a high level and can I deliver what they're asking me to do? Right. So I had to tell them what I was able to do. So, you know, kickoffs were, were pretty much gone by the time I was 42, 43, mm -hmm. which was still pretty late to kick off, by the way. No question. It was. Yeah, um, I agree. But like the 50 plus yarders, they kind of went by the wayside, you know, in my mid 40s. Mm -hmm. So the team that hired me, they just had to realize, listen, 50 yards and in this guy's money. You know, right. if you want to, if you want 10 for 10 inside 42 yards, I'm your guy, you know. Right. And and, this, and you don't even have to question it. And and you know, so that's where I had my best year. And in, in at 47 years old, I was the um Actually, the oldest guy in my last game in my career, the oldest guy to become special teams player in the NFC. I went four for four against the Seattle Seahawks. And my year that year was, I think I was 24 for 26. I missed two field goals all year. Wow. And my longest was 49 yards or something like that. So I didn't hit any bombs, but, you know, I kicked yeah, my that, age. That, that's still <laughs> out there. I mean, uh, yeah. again. So I just, well, it was great confirmation validity for me to be able to play at a high level late into my 40s so I was I was very proud of that but the reason I was able to do that is I had systems in place physically right. and mentally where I could always go to a happy place if things went wrong and they seldom did because I knew my limitations right you know and that's really that's a long answer to a, a, a short question so. no but I think people find that interesting I think something that's interesting that maybe we can go into uh, briefly is I don't know at what point you started tracking all of your field goals that you did in practice not only in, in practice during the year but during camp but I think people would find it interesting to see how much attention you paid to each kick that was on film uh, in practice not only in the game 
1989 when I started. Was being that when it all changed? Team Anderson. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's when everything changed. When everything became structure, and I have, I have books. I mean, that are, they're in my office right now. And um, right. You know, I would I would do a performance feedback sheets after the game. I would log mm -hmm. every kick, and you saw them. Yeah. And I would do my goals, my weekly goals. I would set goals specific, objectively. You know, larger goals, smaller goals, mm -hmm. motivational goals uh realistic goals you know goals are like uh road signs on a highway you know any road will take you there unless you know where the hell you're going you gotta you, you need to know where you're going right any road will eventually take you somewhere so i decided to be proactive about that yep. goals to me are kind of like uh signs on the road yep. that that direct you yeah, that's, I, I think that's a great analogy. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about game day and your performance. I tell this story sometimes uh, when I'm speaking to people, which is there were two or three times during the years that you were here with me where, I mean, you, you weren't cooking great, you weren't kicking great in, in, in the pregame. And you even came over to me you're like, Kendall, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, I'm just not striking it. No and clue. I know then it, it was a fluke. And I remember telling you, I said, listen, you've been doing this how many years, 18 or 19? You just keep kicking, just keep trying to work it out. And in the game, your body's going to take over because it's been doing it for decades. And generally, that's what happened. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, I had those instances that I was around. But can you talk about sometimes when you've had difficulties in your career in terms of not performing the way you liked and how you handled it, what your mindset was there? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that John Silva, my sports psychology guy, like we talked through, the, when you set up a mental training program, there, there has to be a certain amount of introspection in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a certain amount of honest uh, evaluation about where, where am I? And what, what, are, what are my specific demands on myself? Am I realistic in my goals? Am I being a perfectionist? And we found out I was a perfectionist. I didn't want to miss any kicks well if you set a goal that says i want to be 100 percent," when you miss a kick that goal goes out the window right so we started looking at it differently we would have goal windows so if we hit that window you know, i remember that yeah remember that i do remember you saying yeah goal so yes. so um yeah. as far as coping mechanisms which is really important i mean it's mm -hmm. not when the hands are above your head that things are going great that that you develop and that when you improve it's really when your back's against the wall I think yes when it's tough and you know the military talks about it a lot Frank Gans talks about it a lot the world of sock embrace you know, the sock yes embrace the sock right so mm -hmm. so that was really kind of my my, my mantra is I, had, I felt like I wanted to embrace the sock and I knew I was going to miss kicks he was you don't want to miss two in a row three in a row mm -hmm. you don't want that to become a habit Mental training it deals with making your dominant behavior positive. So that's why we grind, you know, the mastery rehearsals, but we also work on coping skills and coping rehearsals. And one of the things that I told myself always was once the kick leaves my foot, it leaves my mind. Can't have yes. it back. It's gone. Snap leaves your hands. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And that really helped me a lot. You know, and, and also that not one kick, good or bad, defined me as a kicker, didn't right. define my ability. And to your point, you've done this forever. Go to your happy place. It's going to your, your dominant behavior is going to take over when it's right. game time. And usually it did. And yeah. I, I've had many instances where my warm ups were were terrible, you know, where I couldn't hit the side of a barn. But I just trusted that it's a warm up. Right. Doesn't count. Yes. It's a warm up. You're warming your body and you're getting your swing. It's like being on the on the practice range, on the driving range in golf. Once you stand on the first tee, now it's a different deal, right? Same in game. So I I was always able to. I was a gamer. I felt you know where I would agree when we when it, when the lights came on, man, my dominant behavior took over, regardless of the quality of the warm up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was okay. it. Okay, so I want to go into this also a little bit. I think it goes with it is I've always said the kickers that I were around, well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Some people would ask me about kickers because sometimes kickers and punters get a little bit of a stigma and I would correct them. I said, you know what? S some of them are a little bit off and they don't play very long. 
the kickers and the punters that play a long time are the ones who are just like you and me and, and they're normal everyday people and they can let things go and they know when to turn it on and turn it off and I, I think that's maybe something special that you had was I mean, I remember a couple of years, it was you and I, Trent Green, uh, Todd Collins, a few guys, we'd go out and, and eat the night before. I mean, we were all just part of the pack. We were normal and it didn't matter that we were, were quote unquote specialists. I mean, everybody had a respect for that, but I mm -hmm. think that carries over also when you can relax and be a part of the group and not be focusing on the job tomorrow, you know, 24 seven, because otherwise I think you will just grind yourself out. That's right. I think, well, I think street cred, okay, cred with your credibility with your teammates are, are earned every day in mm -hmm. the way you exhibit your behavior. And are you a professional? Are you showing up on time? Are you, are you put in the work? Have you earned the right to play on Sunday afternoon? Mm -hmm. And really where we were and, and whether, you know, it's Kendall Gammon or, my, or myself or Trent Green or, or, or Todd Collins, they all had this, we all had the same in common. We, we worked extremely hard. We prepared diligent, diligent, gent, I can't even say it. You know what I mean? I do. We, we prepared a hundred percent and uh, just, it's a Danish thing. I get it. Diligently. There it was, <laughs> there it was. And, you know, we're sitting there having a glass of wine before the, the night before the game and, and being guys and enjoying that. And it didn't matter what position, because we had a couple of things in common, you know, right. We had a trust that the, we had each other's back. Like tomorrow, I got your back. You got my back, and we're mm -hmm. we're gonna try to do something special as a team. I mean, let's face it: in football, you got very few shots. It's like March Madness, you know, in right. a way. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you got one shot and you're done, and then you yeah. gotta wait a week. You yeah. know, it's not we're not playing three out of seven. You four out of seven, three out of five. Right. You know, <laughs> there's an immediate there, there, there's a sense of urgency to a season that has 16 games. That now 17 will will have 17, but. So to me, I mean, every Sunday was really precious, very important. And how right. do I get, how do I get to, how do I, how do I perform those three hours on Sunday? I think is paramount, but I got to earn the right. And that's what we did, you know, and I think that's why it worked for us. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. The power of gratitude. And this is something that's very important to me. I'm curious about you and your thoughts in your life. Are, are there a few people, are there a few events uh, that are, you were grateful for and why? Oh, absolutely. I mean, gratitude is an attitude of gratitude, right? That's that's mm -hmm. Chick-fil-A's motto anyway. So it's a Georgia, a little Atlanta plug for you uh, <clears throat> with the Kathy family. They're great um, and they've done it the right way. So I, I feel the same way. You know, Bob Wilbur, if he hadn't come to me, Dave Baker, my I mean, Dale Baker, my host file, if they hadn't come to me and said, hey, would you try out for the football team? You know, I may have played. You know, I may have become a gymnast or, you know, a, a track and field guy or, well, maybe not a gymnast, but, <laughs> but I actually was on the gymnastics team, but okay, that's a whole, you know, that's a, that's a story for another pod. Yes. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> but gratitude is an important component uh, as being part of a, a whole human being, right? Because no one gets there by themselves mm -hmm. and it's important to recognize when special people enter your life and, and hand you, give you a hand or give you advice or mentor you. And certainly Bob Wilbur, Dale Baker, people at Michigan State early in my career, early in my American life, and even people back home in Denmark where I'm from, mm -hmm. you know, they're my parents, the way I was brought up. So there's a lot of reasons to be, to be grateful right. for the journey because it is uh, a fantastic journey. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic road I've tra traveled and unexpected in many ways, but, but uh, fun and uh, eventful and, uh, you know, full of passion and energy and, and, and just great people that are, were really good at what they did, including yourself. And I think when you meet people in, in, in the high performance business, you, you realize that it takes, it takes a special, special willful, a grateful person to to operate and to rest there. It's not a place that a lot of people stay for a long time, you True. know, because it's, it has to be a habit. It has to be, you know, born mm -hmm. out of a, a habit. And a habit comes from discipline. Yep. And, and discipline comes from hard work and consistency. And, and then that comes from what? Intent and purpose. And that comes from a thought born out of gratitude, maybe. So maybe taking it from 
from that perspective and bringing it backwards uh, makes more sense. Uh, but I, I would say that gratitude is one of the pillars of any sound human being. You know, and I, I, that's beautiful. That's, you know, I, I ask that every time I speak with somebody and, and that's one of the most eloquent uh, uh, ways I've had it put. So I like that. So, you know, a lot of that uh, you said is, is about making a difference. So this, this next se segment, make a difference. You know, we talk about what others have done for us and how we can do for others. And, and I know that's a very big part of your life, Morton. Um, can you talk about some of the things that you do off the field to make a difference with others? So I would say the first thing I would say about making a difference is that you have to realize that you are different, that you are special and to embrace the uniqueness of yourself and to rest comfortably in your own skin. Mm -hmm. you know, too many people look to others and what if and is the grass green on the other side and so forth. But once we are able to rest within ourselves and kind of uh, take a step back and say, listen, I am with all my flaws, with all my assets, what? It is what it is. I am here, but I'm also uh, a subject that can improve. Mm -hmm. And I have to do that purposefully and with intent and gratitude, gratitude like we just talked about. How do I make a difference? I, I put in number one, I put in the time, right? But I have to start by doing something with intent. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You have to do it proactively. Reactive people uh, are, are, to me, very, not attractive because we can all be reactive. It's very right. easy to judge, very easy to just sit and listen and go, well, I told you so. Oh, I, you know, mm -hmm. or judge others. But when you're willing to take risks, when you're willing to actually put yourself out there and say, I'm, this is what I stand for. And I'm not talking politically, religiously or sexual right. orientation. I'm just talking about as a human being, this is what I stand for. You know, you want to go as basic as good versus bad or, you mm -hmm. know, good morals, ethics versus bad morals and ethics. But mm -hmm. whatever it is, whatever your cause is, you, you have to proactively and with intent go there and then and go there with passion and, and be willing to spend time and to, to listen to people. But but to also hold your ground, I think that's important. You can't. And but it starts within yourself with right. self-confidence and self-affirmation. But let's unpack that a little bit. You said about sure. with, with others, th th there is something off the field um, with, with your foundation that you work with quite a bit. Is there not, is it? Is that the Wounded Warriors? Yeah, the military, so Special Teams for Special Ops was an event that we created, I came up with a name uh, for a special ops community. And we, we've we been doing that for eight, nine years now. Of course, last year with COVID, we, we had to postpone everything. But right. Yeah, I know, but um, we've raised over a million dollars for for our soldiers, for our special ops guys. And I'm talking about Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, Marines, uh -huh. you know, the uh, the, the Air Force uh, special ops. So any anybody that comes under the umbrella of Special Operation Command, SOCOM, mm -hmm. we try to help. We help them through an, a local organization in Atlanta uh, called Operation One Voice, and they're they're made up of volunteers who are firefighters and police officers who are now retired and that so we support that we we support law enforcement law enforcement and firefighters and so we just uh we're grateful we have great great gratitude for for these heroes and uh want to do as much as we can uh to help them and you know the money i'm a fundraiser that's what i do right you know my name and and morton anderson family foundation we we raise the money and we give it away Right. We're not sitting on a lot of cash here because when we raise it, we give it away. Exactly. And that's the point of having a 501c3. You can do that. It's a vehicle for yes. fundraising. That's, mm -hmm. So that's simply. And then we also do a lot with the boys and girls clubs. I think that's really an important uh, component within a quality of life program for the young people, mm -hmm. especially those three, four hours after school before their parents get home or there. A lot of people come. A lot of kids come from single parent homes. So. Right. Uh, their their mom and their dad comes home from work. There's three, four hours when they get out of school where they're going to be by themselves. Well, they can go to the Boys and Girls Club and they, mm -hmm. they can get mentored. They can do their homework and they can engage in some positive uh, behavior and activities. So we're, we're big supporters of that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I wanted to bring that to light because I thank I you know, very much. I appreciate I know that, that is, a, is a big passion of yours. 
Um, I want to go back a little bit, and then we'll finish up. I'm not sure how long we've been on. We, you and I could talk for days. <laughs> we we can go honestly. forever, yeah. Um, but you had several years where you were up for the Hall of Fame, and, and you didn't get it. And then the year comes, and you get that knock on the door, and they all of a sudden say, uh, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Folks, if you don't know, um, that's what he used to look like. <laughs> We'll, we'll just put it that way. The mullet, right? The the business in the front, the party in the party back. Party in the back. Hey, you're, you're, you're nothing but party in the back. There's, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. There, there's some business to it also. But can, can you right. go through the highs and the lows of um, when you didn't get selected and, and then, you know, even take it further to, to that year that you did get selected and, and just the emotions that flowed through you? Well, first of all, we're talking about a first world problem here. Agreed. This, no, is, this, agree. is, this is a high-end problem to have, number one, mm -hmm. to even be considered for induction into Canton. So uh, I really I wasn't bitter or frustrated when I had to wait five years because I also re – I looked at Lynn Swan. He waited 17 years. You know, I looked right. at other, other players that waited a lot longer than me who certainly had as much talent if, and played right. in everyday positions, so, mm -hmm. in every down position. So – I, I was just really, again, I'd go back to grateful. I was grateful that I was considered and I was a semifinalist my very first year. Mm -hmm. And every year thereafter, I was a finalist. And eventually, you know, they can't ignore you because you're exactly. knocking on the door. You're in the Especially room every you. What? If there's you're in that, that it's not right. going to be ignored. It's Morton Anderson. I think that's, that's right. correct. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. So you can't beat your own drum, number one. Right. It's, it's really not up to you. So you have, uh, you have people that speak on your behalf and, you know, in the beginning, they, they didn't get a lot of time with me. And I think in the last year there was, there was great discussion. And, mm -hmm. and um, I think the consensus was it was it, that it was time for me to be inducted. I don't know what the conversation was, but I right. just know I had enough votes and that's all I care. That's all I cared about. That knock on the door from Dave Baker was beautiful. And so I'm, I'm extremely proud and grateful and, you know, honored to represent all the teams I played for and all the players that, you know, played with me and helped me, including right. you, yeah. who, who share in the gold jacket with me, share in the bronze bust and, you know. Uh, I'm sharing it, but not to the degree that I actually get to try the jacket on, just. Well, you certainly could if you wanted to, <laughs> but I mean, it'd be a little small on you. <laughs> so during the whole time when it happened or, you know, going to, you know, get the pictures so they could do the bust or going to tour the thing or, or the, the uh, ceremony itself. Is there one specific point where things just really became overwhelming and you're just like, I don't, I don't even know what to think. This is so unbelievable. Is there, was there any one time that really just flushed you up pretty good? I think there were several moments, you know, there, okay. were, there was a moment when, when I'm standing there and with my wife in the hotel room and the door you know, it sounded like Navy SEALs were coming through the hotel door, but it was Dave Baker, who's a big man. Yeah. And I, I was glad he had a velvet jacket on because I cried and it, th that jacket absorbed liquid pretty easily. So, so I was grateful <laughs> for that. Yep. And then taking the stage, you know, for the NFL honors, getting mm -hmm. measured uh, for the bus that took a, a, a big measuring device to get, get my head. But You beat me to it, but that's okay. Yes. And the gold jacket measurement was special. Come on, uh -huh. I mean, they have a regular jacket. It was blue, I think. And but you know that the real deal is going to be, uh, it's going to be gold, you know. And um, and I think going back to Denmark and talking to my parents and all those things, and then mm -hmm. the induction itself with my son Sebastian presenting. Well, there's so many things. And then really the after party with you guys mm -hmm. and the pictures we took and the the good glass of wine we shared. I mean, it was pretty good. Right. The whole yeah, ride has been pretty it's awesome. good. I, I feel very fortunate in the fact that you invited me there and I could share in it and, and so proud of you and you know that. So we've, we've talked about your mindset. We've, we've talked about a lot of different things. I, I, I want to have a little fun also because I, I, I think this is one of the most, what, there, there's, there's a lot of beautiful things about you, but I think this one is very interesting. I think you'll be okay talking about it, but the, it hasn't been all wine and roses in your career. You, you've missed some kicks that, that, that meant something. And you missed a kick once that um, sent another team, uh, I believe Jacksonville to, to the playoffs. <laughs> Is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah. We're going back to 1996, the last okay, game. Okay, so we're going back. So that that's not the big deal, though. Is, 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 you know, that happens, and, and, mm-hmm. and you go about those, those things. But in the offseason, you get asked to, to, to do a ceremony mm-hmm. uh, with that. I think you know what I'm talking about. Can yeah, the Jaspers. Talk about that. Yeah, Jacksonville, they had like their Oscars for football or for sports in Jacksonville, which I can't imagine that's a long list. <laughs> I agree. You have the Jaguars and then you have the Jaguars and you might have a golfer. But this right. this particular one was like, you know, sportsman of the year. And it was Mark Brunel. And I was a surprise presenter at the end. So in order for this to make sense to your listeners, you know, I slipped on the kick. It was a 30 yard kick at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. I slipped. It was a, a muddy field. I slipped. I pushed the, the ball wide left on a 30 yard field goal that caused us to lose the game. Jacksonville was in the playoffs for the first time as an expansion team. And they went deep. They, I think they went all the way to the AFC championship game, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And I might, they might've gotten beat by the Denver Broncos or somebody, but uh, so it is what it is, but Jacksonville, uh, somebody from the sports commission reached out to me in the off season and said, you want to come down and present Mark Brunel as a surprise guest at the very end, you'll be the last presenter. It's a last award. It's a, black tie and we'll fly you down. We'll pay you X amount and you can play sawgrass. You can play TPC sawgrass and golf and dinner, whatever you want to do, right? You know, and, mm-hmm. and um, so I brought three buddies with me and I, I uh, went and got on stage and of course pretended to fall as I was going out there and very nice uh, and I got a big standing ovation. So, you know, sometimes I think, my point is really that sometimes, you know, distasteful things happen to you right? in pro sports. But if you're able to not take yourself too seriously. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and have some levity and have some fun with it. Listen, we were three and 13 in Atlanta. You know, we would have been four and 12. Okay, great. You know, right. we would have actually gotten a worse draft pick, you know, Contrary to popular belief, I was not paid off. Nobody bribed me. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, no, that, that, that's fun. To do. But okay, but I, let's let's reset this a little bit also. Is you, a big thing is don't take yourself too seriously. You said that was 96, right? Mm-hmm. And you played until what? What year? Oh, seven. Okay, so you played another decade uh, nearly. Now, and more. Yeah, I mean, more. What happened to you? not would, but has ended the career of many, a kicker, a punter, a, mm-hmm. a quarterback, a receiver of missing something in a game that was deemed very important. It could have won the game. Yeah. And I think that's something that people can learn from is don't take yourself too seriously and understand there's, there's a lot left in, in not only, you know, maybe the next few years, but your career in general, is that a fair statement? Yeah, it is. And, and it leaves the foot, leaves the mind. Again, yes. it was one kick. Now it was the last kick of the season, so I had to stew on it till '97. The right. whole coaching staff got fired, and here comes Dan Reeves. Well, Dan wasn't getting rid of me. He knew what he had. Right. And now exactly. I, I wasn't going to go out and miss three, four in a row. Mm-hmm. That was not a good idea, which I didn't. I had a great '97, '98. We go to the Super Bowl. You know, I have a, a kick in the NFC Championship game against the Vikings that put us in the Super Bowl. And exactly. Open. So I think he was happy with the, what he had. Right. And, you know, and I played there in 99 and 2000 and go on to New York. So, yeah, you, you take everything. Mm-hmm. You take everything that's given to you and that you earn and that you mess up. And it's part of the kaleidoscope, the, 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 the milieu, if you will, of the life. And it's just part of it. The right. good, the bad and the ugly. I mean, the, it is what it is. And you, got, you have to be willing to say, listen, we're human beings. We're not robots. Right. You, know? you, you haven't snapped the ball perfectly every time. Exactly. You haven't. I mean, you, you might have. I mean, you were pretty I, I, robotic, I have but no, you're, you have you're not. exactly right. And you haven't, you know, uh, blocked perfectly or right. covered perfectly or whatever. So, but we, we go on, you know, we have, uh, I, I think levity perspective is important as you get older. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I talked about my youthful oblivion when I was in my early 20s. I didn't have that. I was just kind of like winging it. But yep. as I got into my second decade and third decade of playing, 
sounds crazy, but that's I was what it just was. yeah, I was coming up with that. Well, that's another thing, folks. Um, <laughs> Mr. Anderson that we're talking to was uh, an all decades team twice. That doesn't happen very often. I mean, yeah, eighties and nineties. I was lucky yeah. there, but um, that's it, phenomenal. It's happened a couple of times, but not not a bunch. Not um, often. No. So, you know, you have to. Uh, that happens because you 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 do. F- you don't forget, but you learn from mistakes, I think. And yep. try not to do that. You try not to miss the kick the same way again anyway. Yep. Uh, I think that's, that's a fair statement. You try to just be consistent. You know, you try to be really good and you try to become so good that you become indispensable where people are saying, man, he's too good to get rid of, even though he's making more money than, uh, you know, we could get a young guy at minimum. Morton's make he's, you know, making a million a year, but gosh I, don't have to don't I have really to worry need, about kicks really need that 44 yarder at the end of the game you know and i'm not sure this this young flat belly can do that no you know? you, you're right because when i came into the league uh you know i was an offensive lineman also but i wouldn't have been there if i couldn't long snap so i was considered a luxury um because you didn't have just long snappers when i came in i helped usher in the specialty of long snapping so yeah you were one of the league, first right yeah and, and yeah for the most part. And when I left the league, every team uh, in the league has just a long snapper. And basically right. you used to say you had two specialists on the team. Now you have three because you have the long snapper as well. Well, that's something I'm proud of. I'm proud of that. I was able to, you know, be the long snap, first long snapper added to a <coughs> roster. Me. I mean, things like that, uh, I think are cool. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. The way I've, I've, I've made a mark on, on, on the game, not to the degree that you have. Well, you um, changed it. You changed it, Kendall. Well, you revolutionized the snapping position. Well, I appreciate that. But but like I say, is that recognizing that, that you make a difference with something yourself, you, you don't always have to have the outside crowd telling you. If you're secure enough with yourself, I think, then generally that, that should be enough. And that's, I think, what I hear you saying. So, yeah, we again, we could keep going, but we'll wrap this up a little bit. You know, something that I think people maybe aren't uh, aware of, though, uh, Morton, is that you have a podcast yourself and you have some very interesting guests. You want to talk about that a little bit and plug it? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, Great Day Nation has mm-hmm. been going since middle of September last year. We've had uh, 31 guests now, mm-hmm. uh, Pro Football Hall of Famers, you know, from Troy Aikman to Emmett Smith to uh, Joe Namath, uh, Dick Butkus, uh, Chris Carter, uh, John Randall. I can go on and on. So, yeah. And then we also had uh, guests outside of football. Uh, to coincide, we had a uh, baseball player, uh, Boomer, who was a, a perfect, pitched a perfect game for the Yankees. Oh, okay. Um, Wells, David Wells. Yep. We had Billy Andrade on last week for the Masters, who played in six Masters and played with Tiger a bunch. Had a lot of interesting things to talk about there. Uh, this week coming up, we have uh, Thomas Morstead, who was a punter for the Saints, who was just let go. I've had Sean Payton on there. Uh, so we've had a t- t- tremendous amount of fun guests and, uh, yeah, we do, uh, we're going to do 42 shows a year. We'll take summer months off and we'll, uh-huh. we'll be going till June and then we'll take a couple of months off and start back up in the middle of August. And it's uh, presented by Vegas insider, which is my sponsor. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we have uh, a YouTube channel, a YouTube, uh, great day nation on YouTube channel, Vegas insider TV, and you can find it there. So youtube.com slash Vegas Insider TV and then just search Great Day Nation. And we're on Spotify, Apple Music, okay. all the platforms. Uh, just awesome. search your podcast and Great Day Nation. So we're a lot of fun, man. I have my co-host, Tommy Freeze Pops, who has a history with ESPN and he does a great job and it's fun. You know, it's... Well, uh, I, think, I think the fun thing for, for folks out there, uh, I'd encourage you to go to it because... <clears throat> Athletes at the higher level, and those are the people that you're talking about, or you know, your Hall of Famers or your future Hall of Famers, that they share more when they're when they're talking with people who uh, are at their same level in, in the same sport. I think they, I, I just think they identify with you better, and I, that's why I think it's uh, so uh, fun to watch, fun to listen to, and I'd encourage you all to to go there, Great Dane Nation, and do that. And you Thank know, you with that. Of- Morton, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, good friend. We may or may not have, you know, had some wine on the way back from some games at times. So may you, have happened. My, 
Different if, things if, happen. if there was a bottle somewhere to be found, we may have opened it and we may have poured a glass. Then you may have said, you know, why wouldn't we? And why wouldn't we listen to some Abbott? Why, Abba, why and, and we may have so, said, why did we do that? Because we could. Oh, folks, <laughs> that is Morton Anderson, the Great Dane, 25-year NFL veteran, NFL Hall of Famer. I am Kendall Gammon. And as always, thank you to Crown Automotive uh, for their support of this show and thinking that it does make a difference as well. For that, take care.